omniscience of God. The omniscience of God. When we talk about God as the all-knowing God, we mean there's nothing about God himself that he doesn't know. Do you know there are things about yourself that you don't know? So many things about yourself that you don't know. I think we had uh, established already that omniscience is the attribute or quality of being, which means that God has the absolute cognition of all things concerning himself, the entire creation, all actual events in relationship to the past, the present, and the future, and all possibilities, and all his works. We were passing at uh, Kitengela yesterday, and I remembered about uh, seven years ago, we stopped there with Pastor Kiama, and he took us to a house, and we had a wonderful meal, something I couldn't remember until I went to Kitengela. I didn't know I had kept that information in myself. So I said, we, we went to this house and we had lunch there. And then uh, I, I started remembering everything. But if you asked me, just anywhere else I would have not known. But there are things about yourself, other things that you don't know about yourself. That's why sometimes you go to the doctor to investigate you, to tell you things about yourself. Sometimes you go to a prophet or a palm reader to investigate you and tell you things about yourself. But God knows all things about himself. There's nothing about God that is uh, strange to him. So he knows everything about the creation. There's nothing in heaven or on earth that escapes the understanding of God. God knows everything. He knows all actual events in relationship to the past, the present, and the future. He knows where else you will be if you are not here. He knows why he has pinned you on that seat. Because there's a place you could have gone to that he wouldn't want you to have gone there. Then he knows all the possibilities, all the possibles. Suppose this happened, what will happen? You know, as we may give hypotheses, but God knows the actual possibilities, what could happen. Then he understands all his works. Whatever God is doing, he understands them. We read a scripture here in Psalms 139, 1-4. Psalms 139 is one of the passages of the Bible that you need to study. And you will just fall in love with God. So like from verse 1 to 4, the Bible says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. If you understood this, that God knows you in and out, God knows you are thinking, he knows you are speaking, he knows everything about you. In Psalms 139 verse 16 says, your eyes saw my substance, I like this part, being yet unformed. The eyes of God saw you before you were formed in your mother's womb. And in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So the days you will live on this earth are known to God even before you live a single day. All the days that you will ever live on earth are well known to God. God has your entire history, past, present, and future in his hands. Acts 15 verse 18, the Bible says, Known to God from eternity are all of his works. Known to God from eternity are all his works. All his works. We just say, nothing escapes the understanding of God. So, in Isaiah, Isaiah puts it like this. Isaiah 46, 10. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand. And I will do all my pleasure. So, if you look at the first part of this. God declares the end from the beginning. When you begin the journey... God knows if you will finish it, if you will faint on the way, if you will be victorious, if you will be a failure, God knows it. Not because he will cause it to happen. Maybe I need to say this when you are talking about omniscience of God. And we have talked about it when we are talking about predestination. Predestination is part of the omniscience of God. Uh, so let's say the best football team, FC Leopards. The best football team, yeah? is going to play with a team that is a bit rough and, you know, 
like Goroma here. So they are going to play. So when they go to play, you are not at home. And you really want to watch that match. Then you tell your wife, please record for me this match. Record for me. So your wife records for you the match between Gormaia and FC Leopards. Then when you come home, you are like, how did it go? She tells you FC scored five goals against zero to Gormaia. You see? So Gormaia scored zero, FC scored five goals. Has she told you the end of the match, how it went? She has told you the end of the match. But now, when you sit down to watch that match, you are now sitting down to watch a match that has been played and is over, and you are excited. Even you want him to score when there is no score there, you know. You are excited to watch this match, but you already know the end. But does it mean that you cost FC to score five goals? You just know the end. You didn't orchestrate the process, but you know the end. So God, because he's all-knowing, he knows the end from the beginning, he knows how we will end up. Not that he will cause us to end up like that. He has given us the freedom of choice to choose life or choose death. We look at that. He has given us the freedom. And he knows you'll choose this path. He knows your end, but he does not cause your end to happen. So he says he declares the end from the beginning. Just understand that God understands everything. So he declares the end from the beginning, but not that he is the one who is going to do it, but because he knows the path you take and how it will end up. Does that make sense? The FC Leopard and Goromaya game. So Psalm 33, verse 13 and 14. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men, all the sons of men, from the place of his dwelling, he looks on the inhabitants of the earth. So he knows. He knows. He looks at the entire world. He knows where people are. He knows what they are doing. Even when you go home and say you're on safari, he knows which safari you are on. From heaven, he sees everywhere. Yeah, he sees everywhere. Your husband or wife may not know, but God knows. In the morning, we said we are by God for God. So you see, your wife may not know, but... The God knows. So he looks from his dwelling place. It's like the world is in his hand like this. We used to sing that a long time ago. Eh? Ah, yes. In his hand, he's got the... We used to sing that. Uh, he's got the whole world in his hand. God can see everything. Everything. We have Romans chapter 4 verse 17. As it is written, I have made you a father over many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Look at it. Because he knows. God knows. So when God says, the doctors have said you are barren but you will have a child, he knows what he's talking about. So he calls those things that don't exist as though they exist. Existence is now when they are now manifested. So things that are not manifested, but God knows their manifestation, he calls them as though they are already manifested. <clears throat> Omniscient therefore means that God knows everything. God knows all the knowables. I don't know if this is English, but accept it as my vocabulary. Knowables. So God knows all the knowables. If there is anything to be known, God knows it. So the omniscience quality of God ensures that he has no gap in his memory. He has never and will never suffer from loss of memory. So God has no gap. He cannot say, ah, which year was that? Which year was that? Uh, God cannot do like that. Like uh, I heard most of you are going to erase the year 2020 from your calendar. <laughs> Actually, next year is when you will celebrate your birthday that you could have celebrated this year. Cindy, because this year was not there. But God does not have that kind of gap. In his memory, he understands everything. He never loses memory. He never suffers from dementia. He is all-knowing. He's all-knowing. All-knowing. So God can never forget. 
he can never forget. So when you do something, don't hide until God forgets. He'll not. Uh, from the beginning, God effortlessly and instantaneously knows the end. And from the end, he knows the beginning, including the entire process from the beginning to the end. In tongue twister. Eh? So from the beginning, God does not have to struggle to remember, to think. He effortlessly and instantaneously. Like he can tell you everything about the world like this. He doesn't have to struggle. Uh, remind me, remind me. You see, I remembered we used to sing a song about God as the whole world, but Derek had to remind me how it used to be sung. With God, he just knows everything. He doesn't have to be reminded by anybody. From the beginning, he knows the end, and from the end, he knows the beginning, including the entire process from the beginning to the end. Like when you take your child to school, how will you feel like a parent if you knew he'll get to form four and fail? Will you pay school fees? You'll say you fail from class one. Why are you going to form four to fail? There's something that normally hurts me, even if I don't know the person. To see someone who has gone through life, the children who have gone through life, they're going through primary school, secondary school, maybe just after university, then they die. That thing hurts me, even if I don't know that person. There was a friend of mine, the brother after university, went to do matatu business. But he didn't know how to jump on matatu. So he fell down and the same same matatu passed on his head. Split it into pieces. When I heard that story, I was so broken down. Because this is a guy who was just gone, and he was the only boy in that family who has gone up to university level. And then he just dies. But do you think to God that was an accident? God knew it from the beginning. He knew it. If you are the father and you know after he has graduated, he'll go to the matatu. Then he'll fall down and die. What do you do? Don't pay for his school fees. Because why do you die with all this knowledge? You can consider the following facts. God is never unconscious of anything. Whether actual or possible. He is never unconscious of anything. God is conscious of all things. God never discovers anything. You know scientists, they discover. They'll say we have discovered the medicine for malaria. Then after five years, they say now we have discovered a better one. Then after ten years, they say forget about the former discoveries. Because science improves on itself. There's nothing God discovers because he knows everything from the beginning. So God never discovers anything. God is never surprised with anything or any occurrence. Imagine you are telling God a story then he says, yeah, it happened. You can't be serious. <laughs> He's never surprised. He's never surprised. So sometimes in your prayer, don't pray like you're informing God, giving God information that is going to shock him. You can't shock God with information. He already knows it before you even begin praying. You know, sometimes we pray like you're about to inform God Something he has never heard. You just want to surprise him. He knows it. Yes. When you hear God remembered, it means God actualizes his promise. It's God actualizing his promise. Yeah. Because God never forgets. We have learned the language of accommodation. There are two big words for your language of accommodation. Number one, anthropomorphism and anthropopathism. Popatism is emotional, pomivism is a attributes to do with the physical. So, to us, it's like God had forgotten us, you know. For example, if right now we just get money to pay for this land, we say God has remembered us. But it's just God actualizing what he had planned to do from the beginning. God is never amazed with anything or any occurrence. God never wonders about anything. Wow. There's no vocabulary in God like, wow. God never researches or inquires about anything with a view to gain information. There's nothing God is researching about. I haven't you had people telling God, think about this God? He never researches. He has all information at uh, his fingertips. Look at what he says in Isaiah 49 verse 1. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and make heed, you people, from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. Calling you from the womb. So from the matrix of my mother, 
he has made mention of my name. God calls the prophet by name while he's still in the matrix of the mother, in the womb of the mother, in the complex structure of the mother. God makes mention of it. Look at uh, Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Look at that. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. You know, sometimes we are like, ah, how do you understand that? God knows you before you are formed in the mother's womb. But it says, I knew you and I ordained you as a prophet. So, even if there's no ordination service, you prophesy. Yeah? You know, there may be no ordination, <laughs> but you just prophesy because God has ordained you. Jeremiah, God has ordained you. In Galatians, uh, Paul also brags about it. He says, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. So according to Paul, uh, his calling was not on the way to Damascus. You know what Paul is saying? That was when the calling was made manifest. But God set him apart to be an apostle from when? From the time he was in the mother's womb. And that's the understanding you need to have. God has set you apart, has set you apart. Not now, but he set you apart before even the foundation of the earth was laid. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, God set you apart for this very purpose. That's why we said the day you discover your purpose, that should be your birthday. That should be the day to be celebrated. You know, sometimes we live like we don't have any purpose in life. Anything goes. <laughs> I remember when we were still young boys, you wake up in the morning and you don't know how your day will be. So anybody who comes, uh, we are going, you go with them. Can we do this? You do with them. You know, you have no purpose in life. How it happens, you just follow it. But now, if you have a purpose, you only pursue those things that lead you to your purpose. I told that to the youth. I think it's the youth. Yeah, the youth. When I was teaching them how to make choices in life. How to make choices in life. But again, we, I think in the Sunday morning service, we will cover it a little bit because sanctification also has to do with purpose. You need to know why you have been set apart. So Paul says he was chosen while he was still in the mother's womb. Uh, that's why if you are a minister, don't let anybody brag about you that he's the one who made who what you are. No one can make you who you are. When were you chosen? From your mother's womb. You know, we have all the people outside here who really tease young people that, oh, you, you know, you'll not be what you are without me. Tell him nothing. If God has used you in my life, thank God. But I know when I was chosen. And I was still in my mother's womb. The scope of God's comprehension includes and is not limited to number one, nature. God is the supreme designer creator and sustainer of all things that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible things, thrones and dominions, principalities and powers. He therefore knows everything from the beginning to the end and from the end to the beginning. So, he is the supreme designer, creator and sustainer. You can go to a building somewhere. Maybe you are a plumber goes to a building somewhere and he's looking for, I don't know where this pipe passes. Or an electrician. I don't know. Which line is this? But God is the designer. He knows even your entire nervous system. He knows how it works. He knows, you know, he's the designer. If he looks at your nerves, he sees them, how they're operating. <laughs> he sees which ones are failing. You know, there are edges you reach. Nothing is working and those that are working are paining. That age comes. <laughs> uh, that's why you see people change walking styles. Because whatever is working, is, is painful. But even when that happens, God knows the entire system. He understands the entire system. He is the supreme designer, creator, and sustainer. Designer, creator, and sustainer. And we're just not talking about our bodies alone, about the entire creation. The entire creation. God knows why he has suspended the sun that distance he has given it from you. 
He knows. He knows why he didn't bring it closer. He knows everything. So, look at how he talks about creation here, about nature. He says, he counts the number of the stars and he calls them all by name. Look at it. Stars. Do you know the meaning of stars? That's the God we worship. So don't waste time reminding him things about yourself. God, remember how I've served you. Remember how I've been faithful. God, you always, he knows. Just let him have your petitions. What is this you're reminding him? If he can count the number of all stars and he has given them names. Some names even science has not discovered up to today. Look at Isaiah 40. 28. This one is very interesting. Have you not known? <laughs> have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Unsearchable. His understanding is unsearchable. That's the same thing Paul comes and says, Oh, Look at this. I like the way the language of the Bible. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Now, I love this verse 36 alone. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Even if this was the only verse in the Bible, I still worship him. This is a major verse. So think about something that you fear so much in life. Let's begin there. Let's think about Ndevili himself. Is he part of this? For of him and through him and to him are including even Satan. They call Satan and his daimoni. God created them for himself. You know, if you know the owner of something, did you hear one day one of the politicians saying, when a dog barks at you, you don't ask the dog, why are you barking at me? You go and ask the owner of the dog, why have you allowed your dog to bark at me? So when the devil barks at you, why have you left him to bark at me? Because the devil has no power to bark at you without the permission of Christ. Job was not indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Job in the Bible. He was not indwelled by the Holy Spirit. But the devil will not go to bark at Job without seeking for permission from God. He says, this is your property. I cannot do anything with this property unless you allow me. Actually, the devil said, you have put a hedge around him. A hedge of fire. Now imagine Job, who was not indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And you now, the Holy Spirit lives in you. You are the palace of heaven. The royal Holy Spirit lives in you. God lives in you. Now, how will the devil come to back with you unless God has said, let's try and see how he behaves. So when I'm praying and you don't hear me say, devil, I curse you. I, it's because I know in him and him in me. Why do I waste my breath about devil? I cast you. I send you the bottomless pit. I burn you. Fire. You know, sometimes we behave like we leave our brains at home when we go to church. If a pastor burns all the demons today, where do they come from next Sunday? He has called fire from heaven to burn demons. Then again next Sunday, he calls fire from heaven to burn demons. I know, son, and you are going to that church, same, same, same church. Is, is the pastor the one with the problem or you? Let's say this again together. One, two, three, four. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And how many things? To whom be glory forever. Amen. There's no better place to worship God than there. Question. <laughs> Apart from Jeremiah, uh -huh. who said, um, 
before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. The rest uh, are showing that the Lord actually called them from the womb. Okay? So, my question is, uh, I would assume, if my assumptions are wrong, you can correct me, please. Mm -hmm. I would assume that children come from the process of procreation. Mm -hmm. So, before that, uh, probably God has not yet chosen them. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you said in the morning, God does not uh, create people who are stupid. <laughs> um, and uh, there are generally stupid people in the world. Okay? <laughs> so, my question is, <laughs> my question is, uh, are we talking uh, about the new creation or are we talking about everyone? Okay, let's begin here. The devil is not a creator. Satan is not a creator. So, Satan created nobody. What Satan has done, he has taken God's creation and defiled it. That's what Satan has done. He has corrupted God's creation so that we may serve the purpose of Satan. But God, before time began, he knew every single human being who will ever be born on earth. Before Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. God knew every single human being who will ever live on this earth. Now God knows your end from the beginning. So he knows your life. He knows those who will be exposed to the gospel and they'll believe. God knows. Those who will respond positively to the finished work of the cross, God knows. And therefore, what God does, he chooses them. Those who will respond to the gospel positively. So he knows what you will do five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years from now. He knows. So when it happens, that's not the beginning of things. He uses the process of time. Everywhere you step, God uses that process of time. To bring you to where he wants you to be. Everywhere. Look at Paul. He took Paul through a very serious educational system. Then he took him through dealing with the powers that be. And then now, after Paul is now up there in the other government, now he picks him up. But Paul comes to think about it. This is not the time God is doing this thing to me. He chose me when I was in my mother's womb. He set me apart. But anybody who will uh, reject the gospel, God knows. And God knows, however much this person hears the gospel, he reject the gospel and he'll go to hell. God knows. Everybody who will uh, uh, accept the gospel, serve God in a particular way, God knows. And then, because he knows everything like that football, he knows from the beginning that FC has scored five goals. And therefore, he declares that end from the beginning. That Bruce, God may be calling you right now Pastor Bruce. You may not know, but God may be calling you Pastor Bruce right now, even without an office of a pastor. Because he knows that five years from today, you will be pastoring a church. God knows that. I'm just saying an example. Don't say that was a prophecy. <laughs> That's for example. So, it's not just about the new creation alone. The entire of God's creation, including animals, God knows their end from the beginning. And when the Bible says he chose them, the Bible is using that word biasly. For example, let me show you the way the Bible uses the word biasly. When the Bible talks about eternal life, it is used biasly for believers. But do you know even sinners will never die? They will live forever, but they will live forever negatively. Yeah, negatively. So the Bible takes the eternal life positively for believers. So when we say he chose us, he's now for the servants of God or for the church or for believers. He chose us. One day we'll take time to look at the elect, not now, but it's not just for the new creation alone. Because Jeremiah says the same thing, David says the same thing, Paul says the same thing. And that's why you saw me traverse through those things. They say God knew them before they were formed in their mother's wombs. Uh, maybe to clarify, mm. uh, so since God knows the hand from the beginning, and you said he is not necessarily involved uh, in everything. He doesn't cause you. Yeah. He's involved, okay. but he doesn't cause you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, that means is probably for 
every child who is born um, <coughs> is probably not the initiator of the birth. Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> <laughs> that yes. means uh, maybe he knew these people would be born at this time, mm -hmm. but uh, probably he, he was not like the, the main cause of that. Okay, now when we come to birth, we look at life. And who is the author of life? Can there be life without God? That's what you look at. Even children that are born out of rape, the worst case scenario, rape. Don't you think it's God who has put life in this child, this life? Is there any, anything that can have life minus God? So when it comes to children, for me, I have a philosophy that all life proceeds from God. So, <laughs> so, so every child is as a result of God's imparting life in that body. I believe so. The process may be messed up. May be messed up. But look through the Bible. Even people like Rahab are the lineage of Christ Jesus. If you look at the lineage of Christ, actually, it's a messed up lineage. Messed up lineage. Do you know that girl that uh, David raped? Bathsheba. So, sometimes, because God is all-knowing, imagine the Mutukama Jacob. How do you form a nation out of someone like Jacob? Someone who is a cheater from, from the birth. He knows he's supposed to be born a second born, but he's holding on the brother's heal that they come out together. He's also a firstborn. <laughs> this kind of person. But God still uses the, that lineage. That is, Jacob is Israel. Then even if you look in Israel. So our perspective of the people that God can use may never be. May never be. So the process may be wrong because of human failures, human weaknesses. But God can choose to use this wrong process to manifest his grace. Yes. Uh, praise the Lord. The Bible says the prophecy is subject to the prophet. Mm -hmm. When a prophet is given information by God, mm -hmm. he will decide when to prophesy. So, man and creation has been given freedom by God to do the things they want. But God knows what he will choose. He has given man freedom to choose what he wants. But he already knows what you will choose. So he does not cause you to choose this or that. He has given you a way. But he, he knows knowledge. He has he, knowledge of what you will do. He has knowledge ahead of before creation. He knew that you will do this and that. You will do wrong. You will end up this way. But he, he does not even influence. He does not cause you to choose this or that. But he has left all of them bare and he knows exactly what you will do. Because he knows what you will do ahead of time, the, I think the issues of language, this is what it call, it's called elect. Election. But some people say, Nimungu alisababisha. CA alisababisha. But because he knows, inakuwa ordained. Inapangwa iko ivo. So God has given everybody and everything priority to choose what to do but he knows ahead of time. He does not orchestrate, he does not influence but he knows the course that you take. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, to, to you, everything you have said, accepted apart from the elect, I want us to have time to talk about the election because election has to do with the service. Election has to do with service. We'll talk about it later. And if you go to the Bible and look at everywhere there's the word election, what follows is service. We will uh, learn that. So God knows, but he doesn't cause. But he has given man the freedom of choice. The freedom of choice. So when you look at time, we look at it like this. God's eye or God's ear. There's a place we call eternity past. For example, we are introduced to the doings of God in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, 
he just ambushes us with that Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 where are you coming from God to start creating do you know anything before Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 but God knows it and that's why you go through the Bible there are tidbits he reveals it tidbits things that were before time in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 we are talking about the beginning of time the beginning of space the beginning of matter time space and matter begins Genesis chapter 1 but before that we don't understand that's why we normally challenge one another if God lives in heaven then the Bible says that uh, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth so where was he before he created the heaven and the earth you see so God knows everything from eternity past. Then he begins to reveal himself at the point of creation. Then there are all dispensations. So from the dispensation of innocence to the dispensation of the kingdom, new heaven, new Jerusalem, new earth, everything in between, God knew it before he began the work of creation. If you get a person in the world called a historian, what does he know? He knows something from here. There's no historian who talks about everything. One is through selection. So every historian selects what he wants to write about. Uh -huh. Then, connection. Eh? If you, you want to write about the presidency in Kenya, you cannot start saying uh, Kibaki was there before Moi and the president. Who, okay. You know, everything must flow as it happened. You must begin with the present Kenyatta, then flow to Moi, flow to Kibaki, Moi and Kibaki, eh? then come to like that. It must flow. That's how history flows. So there's nobody who can say he wants to write about the history of Kenya. You can't write about the history of Kenya because the history of Kenya involves many other things how we used to behave a long time ago, what I used to eat is part of the history of Kenya. What I used to dress was the, part of the history of Kenya. Our culture is part of the history of Kenya. And nobody can just encompass all of them in one place and say this is the history of Kenya. People write history selectively. They choose what they want to write about, then they write about it with a, a well-flowing story. But if you ask God, he can tell you anything about the history of Kenya. Anything beginning with your great great ancestors he can tell you if it is true they were monkeys or not someone said like this this issue of evolution if it was uh, true then how comes we don't still jump on trees and hang on trees and enjoy ourselves up there you know that's something we would like to do it will be enjoyable isn't it? to find a Derek hanging on a tree <laughs> swinging with a branch that would be something good to do how did they deny us such an enjoyable thing so, from eternity past to the cross, and from the cross to the end of uh, human history in the world, God knows everything. There is no knowledge here that escapes his understanding. Nothing escapes his understanding. So, God's knowledge extends from eternity past through time to eternity future. His knowledge covers the entire human history and beyond. So the knowledge of God covers the entire human history and beyond. Since God is eternal and omnipresence, his knowledge is independent of the limitations of time, space, and matter. God being eternal, then his understanding, his knowledge is independent. God does not have to be in a particular place or a particular time uh, with particular things happening around him he is independent of time, space and matter his eternity and omnipresence ensures that he knows everything within time, space and matter and beyond time and space and matter omniscience is therefore the eternal omnipresence of cognition or understanding, this one is a tough one you need to take time to look at it keenly, so because we are mixing two things. So omniscience is therefore the eternal omnipresence. Which means there is something that is always there. And that, that which is always there is cognition and understanding. Cognition and understanding. Cognition is recognition of everything. And understanding of everything. 
they are ever present with God. So omniscient means that everything and every knowledge is ever present with God. Is ever present with God. Look at this beautiful scriptures here. Matthew 11, 21. Who to you, Chorazin? Who to you, Bethsaida? For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. What I'm showing you is this. For if. So if means what? It didn't happen. Okay. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon. Were these works done in Tyre and Sidon? No. They will have repented. God knows. This was not done, but he knows if this was happened in this place, these guys would have repented. It didn't happen. These mighty works were never there in Sidon. But God knows if it was in Sidon, we could be talking about a different issue. He knows but I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Look at this. So here, he knows what could have happened in Tyre and Sidon. And here, he knows there's a day called the day of judgment. And he knows what will happen to Bethsaida. He knows what will happen. He's saying that day, it will be more tolerable to Tyre and Sidon than you. He knows the future. So here we are saying he knows the probable. He knows the possible. He knows what could have happened. He knows the future, what will happen. And look here. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to heads. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it will have remained until these days. Sodom was destroyed a long time ago. But he's saying, what is happening in Capernaum right now, if it only happened in Sodom, those days, today we'll be still having Sodom. Look at the knowledge of God. He's bringing past events, future events, present events. God is all-knowing. He knows the actuals. He knows the possibles. Sodom, they never saw Jesus Christ. But the great works were never done there in Sodom. But God knows if this would have happened, whatever is happening in Capernaum, if it had happened in Sodom, then Sodom will not be destroyed now. He knows the possibles, the probables. 24. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in that day of judgment than for you. Future again is talking about future. So you can look at uh, the other scriptures there. <laughs> Here is our big word again. The anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic means what? When we ascribe human attributes to God. So the anthropomorphic reference to the eye of the Lord or the ear of the Lord is an expression of the divine omniscience. So when you hear that God hears everything and God sees everything. Then you understand is the simplest way. It's a language of accommodation for us to know that God hears everything and God knows everything. God sees everything. So you can comfortably say like a student of theology that the eye of the Lord and the ear of the Lord is an anthropomorphic language. Yes. That sign of Sodom <laughs> the Bible says, if they had been sent a prophet for the same, they would have believed. Uh -huh. Now that the Lord did not send a prophet, so those people stand righteous according to God. If he had sent, they could have said yes. <laughs> the fact now that he did not send. <laughs> uh, I think we'll ask God that. But he says they'll be judged. He says their judgment will not be as harsh as Capernaum, who have Christ and they are rejecting him, and Sodom never had Christ, so he's saying they will be judged, they'll be punished. So you can see there's punishment there. He said they are, let's just go back to that, that scripture again. Uh, look at it. He says, but I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in that day of judgment 
than for you. So you see this judgment and saying that although you will be punished, but yours will be harsher because you have more grace and you are still disobedient. Uh, but God is sovereign. Very soon we'll be learning about his sovereignty. So God is sovereign. He can choose who to serve and who not to serve. But the means of salvation is only faith. Throughout the entire Bible, faith is the economy of salvation. The object of faith may change because like Abraham believed that God will give him a child and uh, he was justified. And you believe that Christ died on the cross for you and you are justified. So what God was looking for is for faith. Is faith. So the object of faith may change from the Old Testament to the New Testament because our New Testament object of faith is Christ Jesus. The Old Testament was the word of God through the prophets sometimes. So it may change from here and there. But faith, faith is the common denominator. Faith. It's always through faith the object changes. Some theologians say it's always through faith in Christ Jesus. I say no. Because in the Old Testament we see saints who are not saved through faith in Christ Jesus. They, didn't, they knew nothing about the cross, but they were saved. So, for the eye of the Lord ran to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly, therefore from now on shall have worse. So you see, the eye of the Lord, here we have the eye of the Lord. The Bible says that ran to and fro throughout the whole earth. Earth. Imagine yourself sitting somewhere where you can see everything that is happening in the whole earth. He has knowledge. So he's being told because you have not done what is supposed to be done. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Every place. Keeping watch on the evil <laughs> and the good. We have a special relationship with God as new creation. We have family relationship with God. But God has what we call common grace. Common grace. Where he says, he sends rain for both the good and the evil. Common grace. Uh, which he ministers to all people. And sometimes these evil people are given maximum time on earth so that they know they rejected Christ Jesus. Is it like Pharaoh? Pharaoh was an evil man. But God allows him to disturb Moses was it ten times? Ten times. God, you should have done it the first time. But he's saying his stubbornness has not reached a level that I can punish him. Now the prophetic predictions recorded in the Bible are evident illustrations of the divine omniscience. The prophets prophesied of things that were to come and their ramifications to man. So the prophet will prophesy about things that are to come. Just like uh, uh, Pastor Gitawa has been saying, sometimes the prophets never understood what they are saying. God will reveal to them, they will be the mouth of God, just to speak for. That's why to prophesy is to tell for the word of God. I normally hear people shouting in churches these days, prophet, prophesy. To prophesy is to tell forth the word of God. And the, you come to understand God knows everything because of the prophetic predictions. You see a prophet who lived... 2,000 years ago, coming to say something that will come to happen later. Like the prophecy of Christ Jesus. I think we'll look at it briefly. You will see prophets of old saying things that will come to pass. And we have done this here, I think. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10 to 12, you can write it down and read it at home. You see even the prophets themselves, they wanted to know what is this that we are prophesying. And they were told some of these prophecies are not for you. It's an illustration. It's a graphical illustration that God is all-knowing and God has all understanding. His understanding is unsearchable and he reveals it to man as he so wills. Look at Daniel. He says, Daniel 2 and verse 45, Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces the iron the bronze, the clay, and the silver, and the gold, and the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. This dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. So Daniel is interpreting the 
dream of the king about things that will come to pass. About how God will come and destroy the kingdoms that will come together to form unity. And God will destroy them with a rock. That rock is Christ Jesus. So Daniel is prophesying here to the king things that will come to happen so much later. But Daniel in his time can prophesy. Where is Daniel getting this understanding? Is from the omniscience of God. Daniel himself does not know what he's talking about. He has no idea. But God has revealed to him and therefore Daniel speaks as he hears from God. So let's continue. Habakkuk. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets. Now look at this. That he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. Are you seeing that? Habakkuk has a vision. He's being told, write it. Send it out. This is not the time for the vision. The East time will come. So God knows things that will come to happen. But he says, but at the end it will speak. It will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. So there's a vision that Habakkuk has. And he writes it on tablets. And sends someone out to announce it, to proclaim it to people, telling them, this is the vision God has given me. At the right time, it will come to pass. At an appointed time, it will come to pass. This long one here in John 16 says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into how, what? All truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. But you can see here, He'll tell you things to come. In uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 19, write these things which you have seen and the things which are, are the things which will take place after this. So, things which you have seen, things which are, things which will take place, they are all within God. They are all within the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we say uh, every prophetic warning in the Bible is a declaration of an impending danger or destruction which can be averted only by sincere repentance. So God knows that I will punish these people. Let me give them a prophetic prediction, a warning that danger is coming. If they change their mind, then I will spare them. The best example may be, okay, we'll look at it in a few minutes. God knew exactly what will happen when the people receive the prophecies, whether they will repent or they will disobey and continue in their rebellion. God knows. He knows these people will hear this prophecy. They will repent or they will continue in their rebellion. God knows. So here, God Father knew the consequences that will follow the human response of the recipients of the prophecies. He knows. He knows the consequences. So, God therefore knows both the actual and the possible consequences of man's response to the prophetic predictions and warning. The Old Testament prophetic predictions of the first and second advent of Jesus Christ is another illustration of the divine omniscience. Omniscience. Look at this. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is so, so exact that a virgin is so exact. A son, it will be a son. So exact. But when is Isaiah prophesying this? So many years, thousands of years before Christ is born. For unto us a child is born. So look at this. Isaiah is prophesying as though it has happened. Isn't that? Unto as a child is born, unto as a son is given, 
and the government will be upon his shoulders. I love this scripture, so I had to put it here because of one thing, that the name of Christ is very long. The name of Jesus is very long. Unto us a child is born, so I teach it that this child is the baby that was in the womb of Mary. And unto us a son is given. I teach it like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So I normally teach it that this is the humanity of Christ and this is the deity of Christ that came together in one person. At the cross, the humanity of Christ and the deity of Christ separated so that the humanity of Christ can pay for our sins and the deity of Christ got united to the humanity later. There's no way the deity can associate itself with sins. So it's the humanity that's paid for the sins at the cross and the deity separated himself. So I normally teach and say, God is eternal and God cannot die. So it is man, the humanity of Christ that died on the cross and paid for our sins. God did not die for us at the cross because of uh, Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 5 to 6. If my God be eternal, then he did not die. It's the humanity of Christ that died at the cross. Yeah, you cannot interrupt eternity. You cannot interrupt eternity. Yeah. You can see how it was prophesied here. And I taught you a word. The union of the humanity and the deity of Christ. I taught you a good word here. You remember it? It's called the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. So Isaiah prophesies this, but I like it because of the long name of Jesus Christ. And uh, So the name of Christ is what? It begins with wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Please. I was taught by the English teacher, there's nobody who has names. It's very wrong to say, tell us your names. A person has a name. I remember my son was in uh, Maseno school. It is, they call it Maseno school. Period. And then when he was performing badly, they called me, they told me, take this son of yours, take him to so many other schools that are here. They have a whole sentence as their names. You know, if you, if you go to Nyanza, you hear Okelo Okongo John Bugazi Secondary School. <laughs> it's a long name. <laughs> so they told me to take my son to those schools and I said, no, he'll stay here until he completes his exams. And at the end, he passed exams. So, the name of God, I think this is the longest name I've ever come across. By the way, look at this. And his, not names. So, if someone asks you the name of Jesus Christ, you begin here. Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That is the name of Jesus. Isaiah prophesied a long time ago. It came to pass. So here, <laughs> now this one is the one that is so intriguing. This one is so intriguing. It's, it, this one Bible because of Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Please believe the Bible. Look at it. But you Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from the old, from everlasting. Now who are these people? Bethlehem. Where was Jesus born? Do you know how Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Because just before Christ was born, they were living in, in Galilee. But because Jesus is just about to be born, and it's prophesied that he'll be born in Bethlehem, a king orders that there must be census. And those days, for you to be counted, you go back to where you were born. And therefore, Joseph had to come back home for him to be counted, and that's only to fulfill this scripture. For Jesus to be born in Bethlehem. Atakama uamini Bible. Uamini tui. So Mika is so precise that the king will be born in Bethlehem. And a king comes and says, go and get counted. It was not about counting people. It was about fulfilling this prophecy. That's how God works. That's why I trust him. Whatever he has spoken about me. So look at this. In as much as the human intellect may be 
a communicable aspect of the divine omniscience, it is limited to the capacity and readiness to acquire and retain knowledge of actual occurrences. Even things that happened, we have no capacity and readiness to acquire and retain knowledge. Is it true? If I told you to say everything that happened on your wedding day, can you remember? But it was such a great day in your life. If I asked you, at what time were you united together in, in, in the holy matrimony? You remember? What kind of suit was the pastor wearing? Did he speak in English or Swahili? You know, you start thinking, ah. So, <laughs> we have a problem here. We are limited. We are limited to the capacity and readiness. Your mind is not ready to acquire and keep knowledge. By the way, do you know that the human mind hates new knowledge. Did you know that? It doesn't like. It hates new knowledge. The human mind wants to protect you within the small knowledge that you have. When you try to expand, the human mind warns you, you are going in dangerous quarters. That's why when you preach the gospel to people, religious people, mosaic people, they say, no, 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 no. I can't agree with you. I can't agree with you. Uh, with this, you know, the human mind locks them, locks them in a place. They don't need any truth. They don't. It's not their problem. The mind must go through training that at every moment you can hear something new. A mind that is not ready to hear something new locks you up and makes you become defensive. You don't want to hear. You don't want. Because you want to protect what you know. You can be, even be violent. Have you ever wondered, why do we force kids to go to school? Some of them even go to school crying. And, and, and it's for their good. It's for their good. But it's because there's knowledge in school and they don't want. <laughs> they don't want knowledge. It's only the time when your mind opens up to learning. And not everybody can open up to learning. Open up to learning. Then you start enjoying the new knowledge being put in. You start enjoying. We, we can have a Someone can talk to us about that. There was a school in, the, in Westlands where they used to go and uh, help the child open up to learning. So, you have to force your mind. You have to talk to yourself and tell yourself, I want to learn. And I want to retain what I learn. And you have to continue practicing what you have acquired. Continue recalling it. Putting it to your remembrance. Then you will be able to retain some things some things. Even Jesus himself said, said it's not your problem. Because when you go outside there, they are the birds of the air. The seed has been planted, but the birds of the air outside there, they are waiting for that seed. They pick it and go with it. So, see makosa yako? It's makosa near birds of the air. So, human intellect, therefore, is incomparable to the divine omniscience. You can't compare. It may be a remote reflection, a remote reflection, but you cannot compare human intellect with the divine omniscience. You cannot. Because whatever has happened in history, we have no capacity to acquire and retain. Acquire and retain. You see, like right now, people know something about what's happening in America. You know something about it, eh? We can tell stories about it. But Ten years from today, you'll ask, who was that president? Remind me his name. Until you are told it was Trump. But right now you think you know, you think you know. You think you know right now. Eh? Everybody knows something about Trump right now. Everybody. About Trump and Biden. Like everybody knows something about BBI. What is good about BBI and what is not good. Ten years from now, you cannot retain that knowledge. You can't retain that knowledge. So incomparable. The Bible ascribes omniscience to Christ Jesus. The Bible ascribes omniscience to the Holy Spirit. Remember the first question that uh, Augustine asked me here was to do with this. Why are you having the same characteristics ascribed both to Jesus Christ and to the Holy Spirit? And that's where we are going next after we finish. the. So, look at this. The Bible ascribes omniscient to Christ Jesus, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew how many men? Is this omniscience? 
He knows all men. Look at uh, here. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into... So the Holy Spirit has knowledge of all truth. This is omniscient being ascribed to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Now that we know that God is omniscient, so how? How does it affect our lives? How does it affect our lives? The omniscient essence of God is an assurance that you are well known by God. Therefore, you can be confident of his provision, providence, and protection. You are well known. You are well known by God. You don't need an introduction to God. You are well known by God. Well known by God. I was telling somebody a story today. I had just started preaching the gospel here and there. I was not even a pastor. And a man came to me and told me, never worry about your provision for God knows your address. That's what a man came to me and told me. Never worry about your provision for God knows your address. I was like, uh, this man, what is he telling me? But I have served God actively for a few years here and I've come to understand he actually knows my address. I don't need an introduction to God. Let me give you an example. Yesterday, we were going to even the people I was with, they never noticed. We were going to uh, Kajiado for a wedding and we had a car that didn't have fuel and someone called me like there's an urgent thing and I kuniona, ni kamambia mini kombaliza ni kajiado. I can tumia 5,000. I never asked anybody. I never told the team I was with that we don't have money for fuel. I told them, let's go. But while down there, someone sent me 5,000 shillings. So I'm sure sometimes they don't understand me because I told them I have no money. And now I'm telling them, let's go to a petrol station. So those two things don't, uh, don't seem to... God knows my address. I'm one person who never panics. If I normally eat supper at 7, even if at 6, 59, I know by 7, because God knows. And for all of us who are here, it has happened to me several times. I think I've told you this story. We are in Kitale, we have preached, and people are so blessed. And then we want to leave, and we have 500 shillings and an empty tongue. And we are like, we are going back to Nairobi. And the people I'm with are like, how? I say, we have 500 shillings. So we go to a petrol station and say, Weka mafuta ya no. we are in Kitale. So when we leave Kitale, we remember, but we know so many people on the road. So we say, hey, where are you? Rapiti hapo. kujeni araka. By the time we are arriving there, he has organized for a fellowship. So we go there and it's like, you cannot just come pass by here. If you wanted to pass by, you could have passed on the road. But if you have come here, you must teach. I pick my Bible, stand up, preach for about one hour. I say we are going. They follow me with an envelope of 2,500. So, next petrol station, Weka, 2,500. Now, from there, we remember, ah, Sister Margaret is in, in uh, Nakuru. So, Sister Margaret, how are, you, how are you doing? I'm from Kitale, I'm going to Nairobi. He said, you cannot pass Nakuru without seeing me. So, we pass Nakuru. Sister Margaret, how are you? We are in a hurry. We don't want to get Nairobi late. She says, ah, nini muna nisumbua? Chukwe elefu mbili enda mkule lunch. Mafuta ya kufika Nairobi mefika. We never begged for money from anybody. God knows our address. By the way, if you take a serious look at your life, if you are serious, you are a keen student of life, you look at your life, you will see that how God has helped you throughout life up to where you are right now. Times that you are almost not sure about what to do next. And God navigated you through life. And you know most of us say this is in Wajanja sana. We think that we managed. You didn't manage. God saw you through. We can tell you stories and stories and stories. Let me tell you one more then you start question. We are in Kisumu. We had been staying in our hotel for one week. We have a bill of I think it was about over 100,000. A time has come for us to leave. We have no single coin. My team is parking in the car. They are parking, they are parking, and I'm in the room alone, sitting on the bed. Because I'm the last one to go and pay the bill as we go. 
So I'm in the room just sitting there. And then a name comes to my mind. So I call this guy. I say, I want 100,000. He says, my wife is due in the next two months from now. And I have 100,000 somewhere. I said, I said I want 100,000. Don't tell me about your wife. And he sends me 100,000. So after everything is packed in the car, I walk out. I ask how much is it. I pay with the M-Pesa. And we drive away and go. That's how we live. Most of us believers, yes, we are programmed to some kind of work we do, and we are programmed to get a pay at the end of the month. So we are not given by anybody. Yes. Uh, so God knows the address of believers according to employment. No. Because many testimonies of pastors, I was given, I preached, I was given. Those people who work. Why don't they have two, three, four jobs that can be given here and there? And there they wait for only for employment. They don't chance on any. I've, I've given a testimony about provision. This testimony about protection. You see? This testimony about something that could have just happened to you. And God knows you are here and protected you, preserved you. So I've just allowed my testimony to focus on one area. My area of ministry. Missions is my area of ministry. Salary is provision. But if you look at the life of even that person earning that salary, there is so much God does in your life far much beyond your salary. Our pastor used to tell us, God can cause the month to end without your salary ending or your money to end before the month ends. We need to look at God as all round. I'm not just talking about provision of money or a provision of livelihood. All round, even in your protection. Haven't you heard people say, Likwa nita kuingia kwa hii you know, isn't it a testament of how God protects us? So God is all around. There's a place we talked about that. Provision, providence, and protection. He brings the right things in your way, the right people in your way at the right time. I saw Derek saying the, the other day, the right thing, the right way, the right time, the right place. You see, this providence, God does it. I think I gave my testimony about provision because my crown is around missions. But there's protection, there's provision, there's providence, there's everything else in the world that God does in our lives. Amen? And even, can you think about it? Paul says, if you are working in an office, serve your boss as though you are serving God. What does that mean? It's God's provision. You are serving God in that office. So we are saying that the omniscience essence of God is an assurance that you are well known by God therefore you can be confident of his provision providence and protection there is no unseen failure which can come to light and turn God away from you God knew you very well long before you were formed in your mother's womb and he called you to himself in the full knowledge of your past and future. Is that not comforting? You know, I've always given this example when uh, a man wants to marry, if there are things about this woman or there are things about this man, if you knew before you got married, you will sincerely not get married to him. If you knew 10 years from now or the things that this man will do or the things that this woman will do, you will never get married. So God has limited our knowledge and understanding. So we know as is revealed to us. But God, before you get saved, God knows all your future mess. God does not save you, then start learning you, understanding you. The way we tell people, you need to stay together for some time, learn one another so that you can know. Apana, God knows you before he saves you. And he knows your entire future. And that understanding, this is security for every believer. Do you get it? It's security. Because if God knew my entire future and he still saved me. Do you know their parents? If they were given your whole life before you got born with them. They say, God is about to give you a child. And the child will be like this, like this, like this, like this. They will say, please God, try another family. They will reject you. Have you ever reached somewhere and wondered, Sasa you mtoto? But God accepts you in his family. <laughs> but you can reach somewhere and look at your own children and wonder, God, why did you choose me? 
But God will never reach somewhere and look at his own family, his own children and wonder who will talk about it. The time my mother asked me, Nana Likusa. So, you know, I thought, if it's my father who is asking, I'll understand. But my mother, you know, sometimes men don't know. But a woman, you are so sure, I mean, you you. There are no unknown failures to God about you. There are no, you know, sometimes people come to cheat you. He looks like you. Yes, my don't do. Sometimes you look at behavior later, you say, you need to quickly, but so you are sure that nothing will happen to you that will be a surprise to God. Everything that happens to you, God knew it before you are saved. So you can sincerely run to God every time you are in trouble, not run from him. Knowing the omniscience of God helps you to treat his word with seriousness that it deserves. Since every aspect of his communication is based on his foreknowledge. So when God tells you something, know that he means good for you. When he says, present your body as a living sacrifice unto God, he means good for you. Don't start arguing with God. Just present your body as a living sacrifice unto God. It's for your own good. So you treat the word of God with the seriousness it deserves. Because you know he, he knows. You know he knows what he's saying. Imagine, think about yourself. You have this pain in your stomach now and again, now and again. And then you go to a hospital, you go in a room there, there's a small boy there, maybe 30 years. Then he starts looking at you. Breathe in. Yeah, breathe out. Breathe in. Then he takes a, a prescription. He writes. This one take in the morning. One in the morning, one at noon, another one in the evening. And you do exactly what this man has told you. And he doesn't know everything. You follow the prescription to the end, whether it heals you or not, but you follow it. How much more the prescription of God? Because the word of God is the prescription of God to you. Why don't we just humble ourselves? Just the same way you take medicine. If you are told one, three times a day, you don't argue. You don't say, no, 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 no. I'll take this one in the evening alone. You do as the doctor has told you. How much more when God speaks to you? Through his word. It's humbling just to say that God, here I am, have your way with my life. Trust God. He knows what he is saying and what he is doing. That's where we end up with the omniscience of God. Just trust him. Trust him. He knows what he's saying. He knows what he's doing. Trust him. So the omniscience of God can be a basis for you to trust God because God is all knowing his knowledge is unsearchable for that reason I want to trust him completely with my life is that not a good application just trust him he's omniscient God even when he says some things that don't look like they make sense to you who told you the word of God must make sense science that makes sense fails many times our own plans they make sense and fail so what are you looking for here sense for what if God has said, believe it. Praise be to Jesus. It's a wonderful application there. Yes. And I think that's the next thing. Eh? There are many other times when you are faced with the inexplicable circumstances in life. Yet you can take refuge in the knowledge that God is all knowing. You say, God, I don't understand this. I can't explain it. What's happening to me, God? Yeah? You are in a situation, you wonder, how do I get where I am right now? Mostly when, uh, if you are a believer in Christ Jesus and you are married, don't be like Adam to start saying that, God, this woman you gave me, no. Just say, God, there are things she does that I don't like, but I know you are all knowing. You can't explain. Inexplicable means that you can't explain it. You don't understand, how do I get in this rut? I'm stuck here, God. How do I ever get here? How will I ever get out of this? You can still trust God and say, God, I know you know much more than I know. You know everything. You know how I came here and you have a way out for me from this place. That gives you what we call spiritual rest. You don't allow the situation to become bigger than your God. You allow God to inform your situation. So look at these few things here. He knows exactly what happened or what is happening to you. He knows exactly how you have been affected by what happened or what's happening to you. 
He knows exactly what could have happened if the circumstances were different. He knows exactly the ultimate good and glory that will proceed from the circumstances. God knows. He knows. There's a man who lost, I think it was a pastor who lost his wife in an accident. And when he was asked to say something, he said, I thank God for it could have been worse. That's the whole thing that he said. It could have been worse. Because God knows. He knows everything. So understanding the omniscience of God should draw you to a sober and holy life since nothing in your mind or on your tongue or that you do escapes the knowledge of God. Nothing. Nothing escapes the knowledge of God. Nothing. There's this big scripture here, big passage of the Bible here. For the word of God is living and powerful. Some other Bible says it's active and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing. Now look where the word of God goes. Piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit. And the joints and marrow. And it is a designer of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, if you know verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 4, just verse 12 alone, that the word of God, Jesus Christ, can discern every intent that is on your heart. The intents of the heart. Now, verse 13, look at verse 13 keenly. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. How does that help you? Understanding the omniscience of God should draw you to a sober and holy life since nothing in your mind or on your tongue or that you do escapes the knowledge of God. Look at what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 10. I the Lord search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. So God searches the heart. He searches the mind. So when you understand that God knows what I am thinking, God knows what I am about to do, God knows the schemes that I'm making in my mind, you change, you repent and just serve God. Just serve God. Live a holy life. Look at First John chapter 3, verse 20. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. He knows all things. Psalm 44, verse 20, 21. If we had forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a foreign God, will not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of their hearts. So the psalmist says, if we had gone to worship another pagan God, God will know everything. Even if we had to hide and go do it, God will know everything. Psalm 90 verse 8, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your countenance. Secret sins in the light of your countenance. God is all-knowing. God is all-knowing. By the way, I had thought I had taught on omniscience, so I was coming to teach on omnipotence today. So we do omnipotence next Sunday. Any question? Bring your question. Don't go home with it. So when now you hear people saying that God is omniscient, your understanding is different about it, isn't you? So we have omnipotence. So omnipotence, the fifth one. Then we may do sovereignty. And then uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe we may do love love or something else. Then what we'll do, we'll take one lesson and combine all the rest and say a sentence about everything and then uh, we now go to Trinity. Do you love God being omniscient? He knows everything. You have a question? When you mentioned about the object of faith changing over time and you say that uh, God could uh, the, the way he saved the people in the Old Testament is different with Jesus Christ having saved us. Um, 
What about the, the, the book of Romans 8, around 20 there, talking about now Christ having to die for the sins of, does it, does it not uh, mean that he, he's dying on the cross but dates to covering all the sins? All the sins? It does Maybe that. you can clarify that. It means that. Okay. Let's hear what he's asking. Read for us uh, Genesis 15 and verse 6. Begin with verse 1 up to verse 6. The Bible says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram mm -hmm. in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. So, God comes to talk to Abram and says, Number one, don't be afraid. Because I'm your shield, or I'm your protection. I'm your exceedingly great reward. I'm your provision. Uh -huh. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So I want you to look at the state of Abraham's heart when God is speaking to him. Abraham is not pleased with God at all, at all. He's not even trusting God. He's telling God, what will you give me? What will you give me? You're coming to tell me uh, that you are my shield, my exceedingly great reward. Because, come on, Mtoto, look at Eliaza, my servant. He's giving birth every month. And here, your servant, I don't have a child. And you're coming to tell me that you are my great reward, my exceedingly great reward, my shield. I should not be afraid. What is this? And Abraham is justified to doubt God, you see? So Abraham begins at a point that he does not trust God at all, at all. You told me 25 years ago you'll give me a child. Look at it now. You lied to me. That's what Abraham seems to be telling God. So let's continue. Verse 3. Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Uh -huh. Indeed, one born in my house in, uh, is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Now the word of the Lord comes to Abraham again. Uh -huh. This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he, he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. So I want you to look at it. God has promised Abraham several things. Number one, don't be afraid, Abraham, because I am your shield. I am your exceedingly great reward. Now he's promising him that don't worry about El Eliezer and ch his children. None of them will be your heir. One from your own loins will be your heir. And number four, he has promised him what? Your descendants will be as many as stars. the stars. Those are the promises. So now listen to verse six now. Verse six, and he believed in the Lord. So who is this believing? Abraham. Abraham. Eh? And he accounted it to him for righteousness. So Abraham believed and it was accounted to him as righteousness. So what did Abraham believe? The promises of God. Eh? He believed the promises of God. And the very moment Abraham believed the promises of God, God imputed righteousness upon him. And we see it even in Romans chapter 4, clearly explained now. So let me ask, is there Christ Jesus here? Do you see anywhere that he believed in Christ Jesus? No. But was he counted to be a righteous man? Yes. Because God was looking for faith. That's what God is looking for. But the object of faith here is the promises of God. But if Christ never came and died on the cross, Abraham will still go to hell. So Christ came to die on the cross and pay for the penalty of sins right from Adam to the end of human history. So for those ones who were before the cross, it was they were saved on credit. Christ came and paid at the cross. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have high knowledge of what Christ did on the cross mm -hmm. and we believe and we are saved. Yes. And that's why we are unified together. That's why the Bible says, in the olden times, God used to wing at sin. Mm -hmm. He will pass over yes. sin. Mm -hmm. But now, he just requires you to believe in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus has taken away sin at the cross. So Abraham was saved and many other people in the Bible you'll see because they believed the promises of God. But their sins were paid for by Christ at the cross. Thank you. Answered. You're satisfied? Yes. Okay. Very. You can trust God. We've come to the end of our Bible study. Oh